pour yourself some tea and get a sweet Portuguese haircut because we have a show people are claiming is the next Game of Thrones. Best season ever! With its complex characters, palace intrigue, and satisfying plot twists, it had me like, Well done, you glorious bastard! Yeah! So join me as we take a look at some of the season's biggest unanswered questions, and make sure you're subscribed because I'll also be coming out with a video comparing Shogun with the critically acclaimed 1980 miniseries. And you're not going to want to miss that. <laughs> The final episode begins with a markedly older John Blackthorne at home in England, or at least that's what we're led to believe. Notice the blur on the corners of several of these shots, giving it an almost dreamlike feel. Considering the episode is called A Dream of a Dream, what we're seeing now is exactly that, and the biggest indication that what we're seeing isn't real is Mariko's rosary. In a beautiful scene about letting go, John throws her rosary into the water, so he can't be holding on to it in England. In one of the biggest reveals of the show, we also learned that Lord Toranaga has no intention of letting John leave Japan, echoing what Father Domingo says in episode 2. If Toranaga claimed you as an ally, you'll never leave Japan alive. The irony of John and Toranaga's relationship is that they both use each other for their own personal gain. John even tells Toranaga that he's the enemy, Dickie. feeding him bullshit to get what he wants. I fit. Shit. This is also a callback to when John first meets Toranaga in episode 2. Tell him yourself. The Japanese word for enemy is teki. What John doesn't know is that Toranaga is doing the same thing to him feeding him bullshit to get what he wants. Before killing Yabushige, Toranaga discloses the reasons he kept John alive. John provided a much needed distraction for Toranaga's enemies, and his presence was used to sow division between Ishido and the Christian regions. In their last conversation with one another, Toranaga allows John to rebuild his ship, later telling Yabushige that he'll just burn it down again if need be. Toranaga believes it's John's fate to never leave Japan, and this leads us to one of the show's biggest themes, the role of fate. Can we shape our own destinies, or is it out of our control? In episode 1, Rodriguez teaches John about shukume, the Japanese word for fate. Shukume, it's like an attitude out here. It's uh, karma. Uh, fate. There are those who accept that fate cannot be changed, and those who take their fate into their own hands. One such person is Lady Ochiba, the mother of Taiko's son who will one day rule Japan when he comes of age. In episode 6, she tells Ishido that hundreds of women tried to conceive with Taiko, but only she became pregnant. This suggests that Taiko was infertile and Ochiba took fate into her own hands by sleeping with another man and passing her child off as Taiko's. Conversely, there are people like Mariko who believe we have limited control over our lives. We live and we die. We control nothing beyond that. While others, like Jin, the tea house owner, believes fate can be shaped. <laughs> And finally, we have Toranaga himself. Yabashige asks him how it feels to shape the wind, or fate, to his will, to which he responds, If there's anyone in this show who controls fate, it's Lord Toranaga, and he does this through his trickery and cunning. My lord is famous for his trickery. At a young age, Toranaga was sent as a hostage to ensure his family's alliance with the Amatani clan, so he knows what it's like to be used as a pawn. Now he uses others as pawns and masterfully puppeteers them to get what he wants. And what he wants more than anything is to become Shogun, the absolute military ruler of Japan. And this proves to be his biggest trick of all. Throughout the season, Toranaga rejects the idea of being Shogun. This is a complete lie, and one could even argue that Toranaga's Shogun ambition started decades ago with the death of Kuroda-sama, the ruler of Japan before Taiko. This guy is portrayed like the Mad King in Game of Thrones, mentally unstable, corrupt, and going around killing people with impunity. Thus, Toranaga manipulates Mariko's father, Akechi, into assassinating Kuroda. This puts Taiko in charge, who just so happens to be best friends with Toranaga, and it's on his deathbed that he even suggests that Toranaga 
Toronaga become regent of Japan until his son is of age. Quite wisely, Toronaga refuses this, as it would put a huge target on his back. In episode 1, Rodriguez tells us of a Japanese saying that every man has three hearts, one in his mouth for the world to know, another in his chest just for close friends, and a secret heart buried deep where no one can find it. Ten episodes later, Yabashigi accuses Toronaga's secret heart, or secret desire, as always wanting to be Shogun. Toronaga confirms this and has kept it hidden because to reveal one's true heart is to risk your life. To show your true heart is to risk your life. But to become Shogun will require Toronaga to sacrifice many of his closest friends and loved ones, including his general Hiromatsu and interpreter Toda Meriko. In a shocking scene from Episode 8, Hiromatsu commits suicide after refusing his lord's order to surrender. Toronaga knew this is how things would play out, but it was necessary in order to prove to Ishido and the regents that he was serious about surrendering, even though he never was going to. Along with Hiromatsu is the tragedy of Meriko. Mariko is one of my favorite characters in the series, and her role in the final few episodes paved the way for Toronaga's ascension to power. Throughout the series, she pleads to Toronaga to allow her to commit seppuku, something he rejects. That's because it's not her time, and Toronaga is looking for the perfect moment he can use her to benefit his plans. This idea was set up all the way in episode 1 when Toronaga teaches his son about the patience of a hawk, how it bides its time, and conserves energy waiting for the perfect moment to attack. Mariko is just like Toronaga's hawk, to be used at an opportune time. And to make this metaphor clear, the writers have Toronaga free his hawk right after Mariko's death, symbolizing her finally being free. Toronaga's plan involved using Mariko to push Ishido into a difficult position. At this time, Ishido had been holding the regent's families as hostages in order to consolidate power. So when Mariko tells him she's going to leave the castle, he must make one of two decisions. Let her go, in which he'd have to let the other hostages go, or imprison her, exposing to everyone that he is keeping all of them there against their will. According to Yabashige, Mariko wasn't supposed to die that night, rather be taken as a prisoner, but her death has massive implications for many of our characters. Although Oshido tells the other regents that it was Toronaga behind the attack that led to Mariko's death, Ochiba knows the truth. Lady Ochiba became the de facto ruler of Japan and allied herself with Ishido to destroy Toronaga, who she believes was responsible for her father Kuroda-sama's death. But Mariko's death has a profound impact on her. The two were like sisters growing up, and in their last conversation with each other, Mariko says, Achiba sees the chaos caused by Ishido and how his decisions led to the death of her childhood friend. Thus, she ends up siding with Toranaga. This is also the outcome that will have no bloodshed. So when the day of battle is upon him, Lord Ishido arrives for a war he's already lost. Achiba's son's army had not come, meaning any attack by Ishido's men would be unlawful. Thus, the other regents end up standing down as well. Mariko also ends up saving John's life. Before her death, on orders of Lord Toronaga, she made a deal with the Portuguese Christians. If they spare John's life, she'll destroy his ship, the Erasmus. The Portuguese don't want John leaving the island for fear that he'd return home and tell England about his newfound land of riches, a land Portugal has a complete monopoly over. Meanwhile, Yabashige's involvement in the attack on Mariko is discovered, and he is ordered to commit seppuku. He shows tremendous guilt for what he did, even telling his nephew not to bury his body so that it can be eaten by wild dogs. It's what he deserves. It's also in this episode we really get to see how John's character has changed. I like how in the beginning he didn't want Fujisama as his consort, but now begs her to stay. He also scoffs at how cheap the Japanese treat life, but almost ends up taking his own to save a people he once called called godless savages. It's also ironic that he tells Rodriguez in episode 1, I won't die in this wretched land, yet almost takes his own life there. By threatening to kill himself, he finally subscribes to Mariko's idea that we only have control over life and death, nothing else. We live and we die. We live and we die. An important thing John taught Toronaga was anything is possible as long as you win. In episode 2, Toronaga told John to give up his war against the Portuguese, as he was far outnumbered and would surely lose. But John says, Unless I win, 
Toronaga, like John, is locked in a war where he is outnumbered, but believes in John's statement that if you win, anything is possible. And Toronaga ends up winning. The final scene has John and the villagers pulling out the remains of John's burned ship. Even Bontaro, Mariko's husband and John's enemy throughout much of the season, comes to help. It seems Mariko's death has brought together many unlikely unions. It's kind of bittersweet, John being so excited to see his ship come out of the water, but us knowing he'll likely never leave. Both he and Tornaga have a moment of recognition. Both men have used each other to get where they are, before Tornaga looks toward the horizon, perhaps planning his next scheme on his road to power. Well, it may seem like this opens the gates for a potential season two, as of the writing of this video, it has yet to be renewed. There are other books in the so-called Asian Saga by writer James Clavell, but none that continue the story beyond what we've seen in the show. So if there were a season two, it would be completely original, not to mention the amount of time it would take to put it all together. But now I turn it over to you. What did you think of Shogun? I want to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching, be sure to like and subscribe, and for more bad takes you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember...